Hey everyone, I hope you're all well, and today I've got another instalment in my Piano Questions Answered series for you. Now, a few weeks ago, I had some questions come in from Church Williams on the subject of reading sheet music. This is what Church had to say. Even though I'm an advanced sight reader, I still struggle with accidentals, mainly because each accidental is only represented once in a measure, and then we're supposed to remember which notes are accidentals until the end of the measure. Even after years of playing piano, this element of music notation still feels like a flaw to me. Why not just write out each accidental? Do you have any mental techniques for sight reading accidentals in general? What we're going to do today is use Church's questions kind of as a jumping off point for thinking about how you can improve your music reading skills across the board. In particular, I'm going to show you five strategies to help you read music faster and better. If you enjoy this tutorial, don't forget to check out my book, How to Really Play the Piano, and my Patreon crowdfunding page, which has some great benefits and unique content for supporters. You'll find links to both of those in the description text right underneath this video. I want to start off thinking about music reading skills in terms of Church's specific questions. So that means we just need to have a quick refresher on what accidentals are. Now even if you already understand accidentals, stick with me because I want to use them to make a wider point about the way music notation works. Now normally when you're reading a piece of music, you have this thing at the start called a key signature, a little cluster of flats or sharps, or no flats or sharps at all that tells us what key we're in. Now this particular key signature has a B flat, an E flat and an A flat in it and it tells us that we're in the key of either E flat major or C minor because those are the two keys that have three flats, B flat, E flat and A flat in their scales. In practical terms what the key signature tells us to do is every time we come across one of those notes in the score flatten it. So when we come across a B make it B flat when we come across an E, make it E flat. When we come across an A, make it A flat. And it doesn't matter whereabouts they are on the stave. So whether it's that E or the E in the space up here, whether it's that A or an A way down here on a ledger line, just make those notes flat. Okay, really quite straightforward. And that aren't those notes aren't marked with flat signs in the score. Yeah, there aren't little flat signs in front of those notes because they don't need to be there because the key signature has told us what to do with them. Now, a composer or a songwriter uses what we call accidentals when he or she wants to make a note sharp, flat or natural, but it's not marked that way in the key signature. So take a look at these two Fs. This one's an F natural but this one's an F sharp. Now there isn't an F sharp in the key signature. So what I've done is stick a sharp sign, an accidental in front of the note. And that tells us that that is an F sharp, the black note instead of the white note that precedes it. Yeah, we've got uh, another one here. We've got um, a flat sign in front of the C. So that means the note is a C flat, which is the note with the white note we would usually call B natural. Okay, but because that's not in the score, we're going to put C flat. Okay, here's another good example. Here we've got an E natural, the white note, immediately following E flat. So um, when we come across an E in the score, we know it ought to be flattened, but here, I'm telling you otherwise, I'm saying no, you need to play E natural, so I've put a natural sign in front of the note. Now, the important point about accidentals, and this is what Church was getting at, is that they hold their force just for the bar they're in, okay? So if this F is made an F sharp, we also have to assume that every other note in that space or on that line is also an F sharp. So this note is an F sharp as well. Okay, it doesn't have a sharp sign in front of it, but because that accidental holds its force for the whole bar, that is an F sharp as well. That wouldn't be the case for an F up here. So we have, if we have this F sharp here, and then the F on this line, that would just be an F natural, okay? And unless you were specifically told to sharpen it. Now, at the end of the bar, that accidental will lose its force, so we know that this F is back to being an F natural again. Okay, we're not being told, but we just know because it's lost its force. Sometimes composers will use what's called a courtesy accidental. Here's a courtesy accidental at the end here. So we've got an E natural here, okay, and we should know automatically that this has gone back to being an E flat, but I'm just reminding you by putting in a courtesy accidental in brackets. 
So that takes us to Church's first question. We know how accidentals work, but why are they like that? If you've got a middle C sharp accidental at the start of a bar, what's the point of making us remember to keep it in force for all the other middle C's in the bar? Why not just slap sharp signs in front of all of them? Now it might seem like kind of an academic question and a little bit irrelevant if all you want to do is play the piano. But if you understand the answer to that question, it can give you a really deep insight into the way music notation works and help you get to grips with your own specific problems with it. What you have to remember about our system of writing music is that it wasn't just invented overnight. Yeah, Instead, it evolved over centuries and centuries of being used and developed by working musicians. Now, if you're a working musician, the thing you prize above all else in a written score is clarity. What you don't like is clutter, because clutter is confusing. Now, avoiding repeated accidentals is just one way that musicians in the past found of cutting the clutter out of scores. There are various others. A really good example is the way we use dots after notes to lengthen them by half. It avoids using loads of tied notes, which again would make scores busier and more complex. Key signatures themselves are a way of cutting clutter because they save having to you know, put a flat sign in front of every E, A and B in a piece in the key of E flat major. Now the trade-off of these decluttering techniques is that although they make music easier to read once you can read it, they make it slightly harder to learn in the first place because there are just more kind of rules to get your head around. Everyone who reads music tends to come up against their own particular problems and weak spots, and they might persist for years. It might be reading accidentals like church, it might be handling fingering or complex rhythms or phrasing or whatever. Now the good news is that whichever of these areas it is that you find challenging, you can use the same strategies to improve and speed up your reading. And as I said, I've got five of them for you. Let's take a look at them now. The first and probably the most obvious strategy is to use pure brute force. Practice, practice and practice some more. But if you're trying to improve your reading skills, you'll find that simply practicing hard isn't enough. You also need to practice intelligently. A really important thing to remember is that you won't necessarily improve your reading ability just by looking at new material all the time. So a lot of people who are trying to get better at reading music, particularly people who are trying to improve at sight reading, think that the way to do it is to get a stack of music books and just work through them. You know, so pick through this piece and then pick through the next piece, move on, pick through the next piece, turn the page, work through the end of the book, move on to the next book, wash, rinse, repeat over and over and over again. And that sort of approach has its place, but it's not as effective as you might think if you use it in isolation. A far better strategy when it comes to practice is to have three or four moderately challenging pieces on the go at the same time and work through them deeply. Really work them up to a good standard, following the music every time you play, even if you begin to memorise them. You should find that that helps to build the links between the score, your brain and your hands much more effectively. Now, if you have particular weak spots, like reading accidentals, like church, then challenge yourself with music that has a lot of accidentals. Also make sure you get your timing right. As I've said a million times in the past, good practice happens little and often. If you practice just 20 minutes a day, every day, and it's the every day that's the important bit, you'll be surprised at how fast you make progress. Your second strategy is to mark up your score. Now it's a really old school way of doing things, but it's really, really effective. Here's a score that I've marked up, yeah, and you can see that I've done various things. I've got that little accent mark that I've added at the start of the third bar on the page. I've circled that kind of surprising PP octave in the left hand there, so it doesn't take me by surprise, and even put a little exclamation mark next to it. Um, I've added a fingering there, yeah, various little bits and pieces. Now this is a piece of music that I know really well, and I ought to know it really well because I wrote it, yeah, but even so, to help me in performance, I'm just putting in a little bit of markup. Now the way you do your markup is kind of up to you. What I tend to do is look through a piece before I even take it to the piano with my pencil and just flag bits that I think might cause problems when I start practicing. But then when I start learning the piece, I will write in various different things, often fingerings, yeah, um, phrase marks, I'll circle things. Sometimes I'll write in beat divisions. There's a there's one where, a place where I've written in a beat division because the rhythm's a little bit tricky, so I can see where the beat lies. Um, if you struggle with things like accidentals, then write in some accidentals. 
but try not to overdo it. Don't write in every accidental, don't write in every fingering, yeah? You don't want to overload your score, and your brain needs to use your markup as a cue, not as a crutch, okay? But, you know, little things like circles and exclamation marks and fingering, stuff like that, they are very useful. Marking up isn't at all an amateurish thing to do. If you go and watch professional musicians in rehearsal, you will find that they very, very rarely work from clean scores. Even top players have their pencils with them and they will mark up their scores as they go. Your third strategy is to practice with separate hands before you put them together. Now playing one hand and then the other isn't just 50% easier than playing two hands together, it's actually 80 or 90% easier. Exploit that fact and familiarise yourself with the separate hands first, then put them together and you'll find that you'll read your score much more naturally and efficiently and fluidly. It might seem laborious, but again, professionals still do it even after years and years and years of playing. It makes the overall learning and reading process quicker. Fourth strategy, sing before you play. Now you might be like, what on earth are you on about, Bill? You know, I'm here to learn the piano, not to learn to sing. But this can actually really, really help, and it's dead simple. All you need to do is pick up the piece you're gonna play, get the first note in your head, it's an E, okay? And then just try to sing along with probably just the top line of the tune, okay? Or any other bits that stand out and you think look interesting. Try to do it while you're beating time. Bum, bum, ba -dum, bum, 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 bum. Okay, it's not going to sound good, it's probably not going to be accurate, especially if you're a relative beginner, but that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're completely out of rhythm, doesn't matter if you're completely out of time. What's happening is that your brain is engaging with the music and trying to make sense of it before you take it to the piano keyboard, okay? And that's really, really important. You're kind of introducing your piano playing brain to what this, what is going to happen musically. So don't worry about pitch, don't worry about rhythm, try to get it right but don't worry if it sounds terrible. Again, this is one of those strategies that might help more than you think. There's a very intimate link between your brain reading the score, your ear hearing things and expecting to hear things, and what your hands are doing. So sing or hum or whistle, even if it sounds terrible, it will help. Fifth and final strategy, try some score reading. Now, score reading is brilliant because it's really good fun. You can do it away from the piano and you can make it as easy or as challenging as you like. All you have to do is get a score to a piece of music, get a recording of that piece of music and try to follow the score as the recording plays. It's all about matching what you hear to what you can see on the page. Now, when I was a student, we used to do it with print copies and CDs, okay? But these days, things are even better because YouTube is full of videos that are basically famous pieces of music with the score on screen, yeah? So, um, you, you know, you can find pretty much anything you happen to be interesting as long as a score exists for it. It doesn't even have to be piano music. You know, if you search Star Wars theme with score, guaranteed it will be there on YouTube. Now, one thing you will find is that these big, modern, very full orchestral scores, movie music and stuff like that, are hard work to follow, at least at first. So maybe start off with piano music or choral music. You know, I've got uh, Handel's Messiah here, okay? Quite, quite straightforward. You could just pick one stave to follow at a time. Um, and, and start off with something simple, and you will find at first that it's quite an effort to match what you see on the page against what you hear, but gradually it will get easier. And as I say, the great thing about score reading is that you don't have to be at a piano to do it. You can do it on the train or in a boring meeting or whatever. Now clearly, score reading is not exercising your playing muscles, but it will help to familiarise you very, very closely with stuff like accidentals and timing and dynamics and all of those things, you know, especially if you, you do things like try and count as you're reading through your scores. It will get all of that stuff embedded at a very instinctive level. It's also a fantastic way of just flat out enjoying music. So do give score reading a go. So there we go, I hope that was useful. Church, I hope that went some way at least to addressing the difficulties that you were talking about. And the big takeaway for all of you is that no matter the particular problem you have with reading music, if you pursue these five strategies, they will help you to make progress, okay? Um, 
yeah so any questions any comments stick them in the comments thread underneath this video um, if you are not subscribed to my channel at the moment please do hit the big red button which is kind of probably around here I'm probably missing it completely but it's in the bottom right hand corner of the screen um, follow me on Facebook and Twitter check out my books including how to really play the piano there's a link in the uh, description text underneath the video there's also a link to my patreon crowdfunding campaign patreon.com slash Bill Hilton big shout out as always to those of you who are good enough to support me on there piano questions answered is a really popular series people seem to be really enjoying it so if you do have any questions about any aspect of piano playing music theory stuff like that send them over to me and i might make a video about them okay hope you uh, hope that helps you make progress and i will see you again next time <laughs>